Hi, everybody. Can you hear me all right? That's a lot of nods. Okay, well, my name is Kevin Hemel, and um, in 1996, I was working on an article about the day MacArthur met Patton in World War I. Um, I was at the Library of Congress in their manuscripts division looking through General Patton's papers, and I was using the finding aid, and listed in the finding aid uh, were 11 photo albums, and I didn't understand what that meant, so I ordered a couple of them, and they brought me out these large books, and I started opening them up, and I was looking at photographs of Patton and of different World War II European theater you know, uh, scenes, and I realized I had never seen any of these before. And what I was looking at were the actual photographs that Patton had taken from the moment he walked onto the beach in North Africa in Operation Torch through the end of the war and even to a few days before uh, he was in the car accident that would take his life. Uh, I was fascinated by this. Uh, there were notes with the photographs uh, and there were pictures of places that Patton had never mentioned he had been before. And so what I realized is this was a sort of a new angle on Patton that would sort of open up, you know, a larger picture of him. And, you know, for any historian studying a certain, any person, you, the, the real object is to kind of get inside their head and try to figure out what were they thinking, what were they doing. And suddenly, you know, here on my lap, I've got everything Patton saw. You know, I have it from his eye, what he was looking at. And I thought, what a, what a fascinating angle to, to examine someone from. And, you know, it, it almost, it made me wonder, like, what if, you know, George Washington had a camera on him or Ulysses S. Grant, and you could see what they were looking at and, and what, the, you know, and it would give you a better idea of what they were thinking. And so um, I first made this into an article for uh, WW2 History Magazine. And fortunately, Martin Blumenson, the, the first real patent historian who had written the patent papers, uh, lived in D.C. and was helping me, you know, through the whole process. And when the article came out, uh, we were talking and I just said, Martin, do you think this would ever work as a book? Because, you know, you, in a magazine you only have so much space and there, there were 11 of these photo albums. And as soon as he said yes, I, I got working on it. So it was a labor of love for years. So what I'm going to show you, uh, I'm going to give you a sort of a larger picture of Patton with some conventional photographs, but then I've kind of mixed into it some of the photographs he took so you guys can sort of get a better understanding of Patton. Um, George S. Patton was born November 11th, uh, 1885. He would be 126 years old today. Uh, I don't think he would have lived this long if it hadn't been for that car accident. Um, but he was uh, born in California, uh, always wanted to be a soldier, you know, had toy soldiers, had wooden swords like, you know, a lot of us did growing up. Um, his father would uh, tell him tales from the Bible and of Confederate uh, battle history. Uh, he would pray every night before he went to bed to a picture on the wall in his bedroom that he thought was God and Jesus. And it wasn't until he got older that he realized it was Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson. So that kind of gives you the sort of atmosphere he's growing up in. Um, he meets his future wife at age 16. He's very unimpressed with her because she's carrying around a um, porcelain doll. And he thinks, you know, she's just a little kid. What he didn't know was that she earned that doll for speaking nothing but French for a month. So Beatrice was already pretty well, uh, a pretty smart gal by the time he met her. They courted all through uh, his days at both Virginia Military Institute and West Point. And when he finally proposed to her while he was still a cadet, um, he went to her house, took the train, and he had never kissed her before. So his plan was to kiss her, and if that went well, to propose. And um, he said getting ready to kiss her was kind of like playing Russian roulette. He was so nervous, and he finally kissed her, and she didn't push him away. And so then, you know, the next plan was to ask her to marry him. And he was so prepared for rejection that he brought with him a telegram from West Point saying there's been a crisis and an emergency, and you have to report back immediately in case she said no. But fortunately, she did say yes. So um, we got a picture of him. This is him at West Point. He made the rank of first corporal. Uh, it's a rank that doesn't exist anymore. I just spoke to a bunch of West Pointers today about it. And um, that, the first corporal was kind of the disciplinarian. So you're kind of thinking, wow, perfect guy for the job. He uh, had stayed back a year at West Point. He had trouble with math. Uh, he was dyslexic. And so he had to repeat his plebe year. So 
If you know anything about plebe here at West Point, it means you're basically on the ground and everybody's stepping their heels on you. He went through that for two years uh, before he started, you know, went to his sophomore year, junior year. So by the time he's given this one little taste of power and responsibility, he goes way overboard. He yells at everybody. He said that he would walk into the cafeteria and just look at the plebes and just see red because it would, he would just, it would, he would just see so many you know, mistakes and things. It got so bad, they took the job away from him. And I think that, that humbled him a great deal, but you know, that's kind of a little bit of a theme in his future too. So um, here he is at West Point. Um, when he does join the Army, his first post is Fort Riley. Uh, he's a, he goes into the cavalry, and he is actually asked to participate in the 1912 Olympics at Stockholm, Sweden, in something called the Modern Pentathlon. And so it's five events, swimming, running, fencing, shooting, and I just pulled a Rick Perry. Uh, <laughs> swimming, running, shooting, uh, sword fighting, and steeplechase. Thank you, cavalry, of course. Um, he did very well in the steeplechase, but his time was a little short. He had no errors. Um, when it came to the swimming, and this is, this is Patton, he would push himself at every event. He wouldn't pace himself. So at the swim, he came in, I think, second, but was so exhausted they had to use a, a fishing hook to pull him out of the pool. Uh, with the fencing, he came in fifth, but he beat the best fencer, which a fr who was a French officer. Um, and, with the, and with the pistol shoot, he missed the target entirely twice. And some Patton fans believe that he was such a good shot that he was actually hitting through the holes of the previous bullets. <laughs> but unfortunately, the judges didn't realize that that was George Patton firing, and they, they didn't credit him. Um, and then finally, on the running uh, element of it, uh, when he... he uh, you know, they ran around the stadium, exited the stadium, ran around Stockholm, and then re-entered the stadium. He was the first one in. And Patton being Patton, he was pushing himself for all he was worth and started to slow down, you know, as he got into the stadium. He was just exhausted. Uh, about three runners got ahead of him. Uh, he finally crosses the, the finish line and collapses. And a doctor runs over to him, and his father, who was in the audience, ran down. And the doctor turned to the dad and said, do you have a strong son? And he said, yes, I do. And he said, good, he's going to need it. Uh, but he did survive it. Uh, Beatrice blamed herself for him not winning. He came in fifth uh, because she said she was pulling him out to parties at night and things like that. She wanted to have fun while they were in Europe. Um, he later is going to be part of John J. Pershing's uh, expedition into Mexico to get Pancho Villa. Uh, the, the city of Columbus, New Mexico had been attacked by Villa's troops and they killed 18 Americans. Uh, the majority of them were soldiers with the 13th Cavalry Regiment. The rest were civilians. Um, the expedition is, is a bit fruitless. You know, you've got basically a conventional force heading south, uh, chasing bandits who can blend into the, you know, the natural surroundings and the civilians will protect them. Um, Patton basically begs Pershing before the expedition. He shows up at his door and says, take me along. You know, I really want to go on this. And Pershing says, you know, I got a million lieutenants begging me to, you know, to come along. Why should I pick you? And Patton said, because I want it more than anybody else. And that's basically how Pershing got himself into the Spanish-American War by saying the, roughly the same thing to a commander. So Pershing kind of sees this and appreciates the Patton, so brings him along. And at one point, Patton says to him, says, you know, I'm, I'm more than happy to be your staff officer, but I would prefer to be with the troops actually doing things. So he gets assigned to a cavalry unit. Uh, and he starts spying out some of what he believes are Pancho Villa's top lieutenants. And one is uh, uh, General Cardenas. And Patton kind of figures out where he lives at a place called Rubio Ranch. Uh, he goes down there one day and they, they capture the uncle. And Patton says, you know, we questioned the uncle and we didn't think he was going to live through it. So that kind of gives you an idea of how um, motivated Patton was in questioning him, I guess you could put it. Um, a few days later, he takes two cars. Now, mostly, you know, the Army at this point, 1905 or 1915, is uh, horse-drawn, you know, for everything from cavalry to supplies. But they do have trucks and airplanes and a few cars. So Patton takes two cars to go get corn and other food for the unit and drives down near Rubio Ranch. And he, in fact, he passes it. And he has the soldiers pull the two cars over. And he says, all right, I got an idea. We're, we're sort of down a hill. They can't see us. Let's turn the cars around. 
We'll race back to Rubio Ranch, park one in the front, one in the back, and we'll get out. We'll, you know, cut him off, basically, a, you know, pincer movement, and we'll see if we can capture him. I just have a feeling, you know. So they turn the cars around. They race back, uh, you know, the... Out of the, the, the ranch, uh, out of one of the doors, come three horses with riders. And Patton pulls out his ivory-handled pistol and shoots one of the horses, shoots the guy in the arm. The other guys open up. The, uh, the Mexicans that, that are trying to escape the banditos, they run away from Patton, and they come into this wall of other soldiers that are in the other car. So they turn around and basically are charging Patton, and they open up on him. And he says that he had to duck behind a part of the house and reload his pistol and come out, and he said there were sparks, you know, flying from the gravel. There was dust coming from the adobe walls, and uh, they eventually kill all three. But Patton said after that, he always carried two ivory-handled pistols on him so that he wouldn't have to stop and reload. Uh, this is something he will eventually stop in World War II, but for a long time, that's, he was had the, the double pistol. Um, they kill all three, and one, I just found this out in my research not too long ago, and it's not in any book that when they went to look at the bodies and the, the, the dead horses, they found um, blankets marked 13th Cavalry. So they knew that these were the, some of the guys that had gone into Columbus, New Mexico, were part of the raid because they had captured American equipment on them. Um, Patton has his soldiers strap the dead bodies to the hoods of the car, like war trophies, like if you had been deer hunting or something, and bring them back to, to Pershing's headquarters the last thing he did before he left was he went up and cut the telephone wires because he said they could see, you know, uh, locals kind of gathering and they were getting a little nervous. So they cut the telephone wire so word wouldn't get out, drive back to Pershing's headquarters. There is no record of what Pershing thought of it, but they, they did bury the banditos. And it was one of the, the major successes of the expedition. Like, like I said, uh, Pancho Villa survived it. You know, he, he simply ran away. Um, and there was just very little fighting. So this was actually one of the highlights, and this kind of makes his name because historically he is the first person to lead a motorized attack in the U.S. Army. It's not the first time ever, but in the, in the history of the U.S. Army, this is the first time motor vehicles and combustion engines are used in, a, in an attack. Um, then comes World War I. Now, one thing I should add, uh, when Patton started working for Pershing, Pershing was a widower. His wife had died in a fire. And um, Patton's sister sort of took a liking to Pershing and vice versa. And there was a great scene leaving the docks for Europe of Patton's sister and Patton's wife waving goodbye to the two of them. Um, Patton, of course, is on Pershing's staff. He's in charge of the motor pool and a few other things. And um, Patton's sister keeps writing letters to Pershing saying, let me come join you, let me be with you, I'll be a candy striper or anything like that. And Pershing keeps writing back saying, no, 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 you, you know, that, that's not fair. All the other men are here without their wives, I shouldn't do it either. And Patton would even write letters to his sister saying, yeah, it's a bad idea. What they weren't telling her was that Pershing got three girlfriends in Paris. And, uh, you know, I guess four would have been a crowd. And so... Um, by the time the war is over, he does return, and she tries to sort of rekindle the relationship, but uh, it doesn't happen, and Patton's uh, sister dies, a widow, uh, you know, dies single. And ironically, I was with Patton's granddaughter last year, uh, giving her a tour of D.C., and we walked by a statue of Pershing near Lafayette Square, and she goes, boy, you know, Kevin, he was almost my great-grandfather. <laughs> the things you hear. Anyway, so uh, Patton's on Pershing's staff, working the motor pool, uh, and basically waiting for a slot to open up, which they were, to lead an infantry regiment. This is what everybody wants, to get into the fighting. Uh, then he hears about this new fangled weapon called a tank, and he realizes if he goes into tanks, he's not going to get into combat as soon, but, you know, here's, this is the cutting edge of warfare, you know, and so he, he, he ponders it for a couple of weeks and finally decides to go for it. Um, there is no American tank corps. There are no tank officers, nothing. You know, there are no manuals. Patton is going to have to create an entire branch and how it works from scratch. So he goes to the factories and sees how they're built and, you know, gets ideas for them and gives suggestions. He studies so much that he ends up teaching a course to British and French officers on tank tactics. And they've been already using tanks for about a year, you know. Um, he finally leads them into battle. Uh, the, it's the Samiel Offensive in September. And... Um, what happens is, you know, the, the, the attack launches and Patton loses communication with his tanks and his orders are to stay put. Well, he doesn't. He starts walking forward. And 
as he's going forward, he goes up this hill and he bumps into a brigadier general named Douglas MacArthur. And they kind of pull out a map and are discussing what, you know, what they're going to do next outside of the town called Essie. And suddenly an artillery barrage starts kind of marching towards them because that's how you, you, you fire artillery. You, you want to get closer to your subjects. And everybody ducks except Patton and MacArthur. And they are just standing there talking. And Patton said, I don't know what we were talking about, but I wasn't about to duck and he wasn't. So we you know, couldn't show each other up. And uh, you know, it passes safely and, and Patton enters the town of Essie. And since that happened in, in 1918, there have been a lot of stories that have blossomed out of it saying that you know, Patton kind of shook and MacArthur put his arm around him and said, don't worry, you never hear the one that gets you. I researched that for about two years and found out that those stories were all fake. Patton wrote about it four days after the incident and later pulp writers writing little dime store you know, paperbacks uh, kind of fabricated this story and then you know, uh, it grew from there uh, to the point I think William Manchester used it in American Caesar. You usually find it in MacArthur books. You don't find it as much in Patton books. But uh, it really was a fabricated story. The two of them just stood there while the barrage passed. Um, Patton got down to Essie and his tanks were refusing to cross the bridge thinking it was mined. So Patton walked across the bridge. He later said it was a really stupid thing to do because he was the commander, but he felt like he had to lead the example. Uh, goes into the town, helps flush some Germans out. Uh, then he climbs on a tank to go into the next town, Penns, and while he's sitting there, he notices the paint is suddenly chipping on the side of the tank. And what he realizes is that Germans are machine gunning the side. So he jumps off, the tankers don't realize it, he has to kind of run up behind them then and say, you know, turn around, let, let's, uh, let's get out of here because that was the only tank left. So that was his first combat experience and he, and he you know, performed nobly. Um, he wished it had lasted longer. Uh, he, so the, the, the next big attack is called the Moose Argonne Offensive and so this is much further north. So they put Patton's tanks on trains, they move them up. Um, once again, the green light goes off, he loses contact with his tanks, he moves onto the battlefield himself uh, tanks are getting stuck in the mud. He's helping digging them, digging them out. Uh, soldiers are refusing to move forward. And he finds himself with about three or four guys and says, you know what? Let's just attack forward. Let's move forward. Let's keep, uh, keep the offensive going. He's armed with a cane. He doesn't have his ivory handled pistol with him this time. Uh, he takes about four steps and gets shot in the abdomen. Oh, sorry. That's, uh, there it is. And you see that X in the upper left-hand corner, that's where he was shot. Patton returns to this spot in 1920 and takes this photograph and says, this is where I was shot. Um, a private named Angelo grabs him and pulls him into a foxhole and, and stops the bleeding. Um, and this is basically the end of Patton's World War I military career. Um, uh, you can actually go, I, I actually went to this area. They don't know exactly the spot because it's changed over time. But there is a memorial to the troops from Missouri that fought in World War I. And they say if you stand on the back of that memorial and look at the field, that's where Patton was shot. So uh, Patton goes to the hospital, recovers from his wound, and on his birthday, November 11th, he's in his tent writing about tank tactics when the word comes down that the war is over. And man, is he bummed. Because here he's trained his whole life for this one great opportunity, and it slipped through his fingers. The war is over, his, you know, what, what more is there for George S. Patton, we all probably wonder. So um, he, do, he returns to the States. He has two tours in Hawaii, um, spends time you know, back at Fort Riley. And on his second tour in Hawaii, uh, he really starts feeling sorry for himself. You know, his career, he starts to think, is over. It, it's, he's in his twilight. He's in his late 30s, so you know the world's over for him. Um, and Beatrice, his wife, is so fascinated with the islands that she actually writes a novel set in, I think, the 1870s about pirates and, and uh, you know, Hawaiian lore and things. And George is very unsupportive of this. He's very jealous. He can be very petty at times. And um, while this is all going on, Beatrice's niece comes to Hawaii on her way to the Orient, and Patton ends up having an affair with her. And uh, her name is Jean Gordon, and she is the same age as Patton's oldest daughter. I think she was... Uh, she was about 1920, and um, Beatrice was thinking about leaving him at this time. And they said when they put Jean Gordon on the boat to head over to Asia, that George was jumping up and down and waving to her goodbyes and made a fool of himself. And as they were walking away, the oldest daughter said, Mom, you know, why are you staying with Dad? And she said, well, I think he needs me more than I need him right now. And 
And he did later apologize, and they did make up. But Gene Gordon will pop up in Patton's future. Um, so there's that, that wonderful weapon I told you about, the tank, uh, is a very expensive weapon. And in 1920, the Pentagon passes a budget, the Pentagon, the War Department, passes a budget saying that we just can't afford to have a tank corps anymore. Now, Patton, when he returned from World War I, goes to a place called Camp Colt, and this is where he meets a young Dwight Eisenhower, and they become friends, and after work every day, they sit down and talk tank tactics and ideas. Uh, Mimi and Beatrice become friends. Beatrice tries to show Mimi how to cook. It's not very successful. Um, but, uh, and there was, there was one story I read that Eisenhower and Patton would go driving around at night with a shotgun in their car looking for trouble. So um, it, it kind of takes away from the, the presidential uh, regal uh, Eisenhower and makes him more of a warrior type, I've always thought. So the tank corps is split up. Uh, they give some of the tanks to the infantry, some to the cavalry. Um, and some of the cavalrymen say, this is a terrible idea. We really need to you know, make a separate tank corps. Patton is not a part of this. He, is not, he does not want to rock the boat. He's a cavalryman. He goes back into the cavalry. So these other officers find an old Civil War camp because they realize if we do this at Fort Riley, the other cavalrymen will see this. They'll say, get rid of it. Uh, it was called Camp Knox. And so they move a bunch of the tanks to Camp Knox, turn it into a fort, and that's where they really start developing tank theory and tactics on a World War II scale. Um, Patton is eventually going to see this and want back in as the, the, the military starts to grow again. He's a referee in a tank battle, uh, and you know it all starts to come back to him, the, the, the glory and the, the fun of tanks. Um, after Pearl Harbor, he becomes commander, I'm sorry, before Pearl Harbor, he becomes a brigade commander uh, with the 2nd Armored Division, uh, well, uh, what will become the 2nd Armored Division. And as the armor forces grow, he begins to take more and more prominent positions. Uh, he ends up becoming the commander of the 2nd Armored Division, uh, which his son will later become uh, in the 1970s, uh, where they really kind of earn the name Patton's Own for 2nd Armored. And his wife writes a song for them that is still with them today. Um, and he does great things with it. You know, he, he makes them do a road march from, you know, across three states. He gets all kinds of publicity for the, for the tankers. Um, during the Louisiana maneuvers, he uses his own money to help uh, when the tanks run out of gas. Uh, and um, whenever they interview generals or, or major officers, you know, in the press or in the radio, they always would find Patton. And there, there's a number of tapes of him, recordings of him, talking about, uh, you know, tanks and how well... Because the theme back then in the early 40s, before we get to war, is how well the boys are being taken care of. Um, and so he, he constantly talks about the young men, how proud he is of them. Um, so Patton's first assignment in World War II is he's going to lead what's called Operation Torch. And so uh, he's on, this is the, the USS Monrovia. He's uh, getting off in a, in a small craft. Now what happened was as they came to the North African shores on November 8th, uh, they swung his boat out on davits and were getting ready to lower it. And he just gets this gut feeling, and he turns to his, uh, his uh, sort of his assistant, uh, George Meeks, an African-American soldier who basically keeps his uniform looking as good as it does. And he said, you know, George, I just don't feel right without my ivory-handled pistols. Would you please go get them for me? And Meeks goes and gets them, and as he's coming back and handing them to Patton, the French fleet shows up, and the Monrovia opens fire, and the backblast from its back cannons crush the... Uh, the little boat, and they have to drop it over the, the side. And, you know, it kind of adds to Patton's sort of intuition that he sort of knew something bad was going to happen, and, you know, all of his stuff was lost except the ivory-handled pistols that he's so well known for. Um, he was supposed to land at 8 a.m. It actually, he actually lands at 12 because of this naval battle. And um, as he gets into the craft, he tips his helmet, and everybody on board just cheers him, and he, he just was eating it up. Um, in fact, there's George right there. George Meeks is that gentleman right there. P Patton meets him in 1928 uh, when he goes to Fort Riley on one of his tours. And um, the house that the Pattons move into, the people that were there previously said, oh, we've got this great cleaning lady. You should use her. And so they get to the house, and the cleaning lady's got this boyfriend, and it's George Meeks, who's a private in the Army, and he had fought in World War I. And the problem was is that this woman was married and George was married, but not to each other. And Beatrice Patton says, we're not having any of this. And so she makes them divorce their respective mates and marry each other so that everything's legit. But if, you, if you've seen the movie Patton, uh, you know, Patton says to him when he's in exile about writing his wife, and George Meeks says, you know, I try to write mine as much as I can. I don't do it as much as you, though. Um, 
That's fiction. Uh, George Meeks couldn't read or write. Uh, he was interviewed a number of times by Stars and Stripes, uh, and, and he admitted to that fact. Um, but he said that he was the only person that could give General Patton orders. Of course, those orders were, you know, what to wear for the day and things like that, but he took a lot of pride in that. Um, so Patton makes it ashore, and, and one thing I'm going to back up a little bit, during the planning of Operation Torch, uh, and basically Operation Torch is three landings along the north coast of Africa to get the United States involved in the war in Europe. And Patton's is the only attack, and it's on the, the far west coast in Morocco, that is purely American. It's going to leave from the United States and ar arrive in Morocco. The other ones leave from England, and it's a mix of American and British troops. So during the planning stage, the British tell Patton, listen, we think your landing is irrelevant. We don't need it, you know. And Patton would get furious. He was stationed in Washington at the time. He got so mad that one day he came home to his house, and he picked up a small statue that his wife had purchased in Hawaii. It was a lava carving, named, and they named it Charlie, and it was a war god, and it was supposed to bring warriors good luck. Well, Patton takes Charlie out into the backyard and throws it into the pond and says, you know, this is whole, such a mess, I'm so angry. So Patton takes this ship onto shore, and the first thing he sees is a British officer in an American uniform walking up to him, holding Charlie, and that's Charlie right there. Uh, the British officer is um, Robert Enriquez, and Patton's like, what are you doing with, Pat what, what's going on? And Enriquez tells him, he said, listen, your wife gave this to me. She went and fished it out of the pond and gave it to me. I, he was his liaison officer with the British, and he said, give this to Georgie when he lands. It'll bring him good luck. And so that's the first thing Patton sees when he steps ashore. Um, after he accepts the statue, he kind of takes a look around, and he sees guys in Foxhole's not doing anything, no sense of urgency on the beach, and an Arab with a donkey picking up American equipment and throwing it on the donkey's back. And so Patton kind of eyes him, and suddenly the, the, uh, the Arab picks up an American rifle and starts to put it into the donkey's, you know, on the donkey's back. Well, Patton pulls out his ivory-handled pistol, <laughs> takes his first shot of the war, goes by the Arab's head, but the Arab got the message. He dropped the rifle and... He and the donkey took off. Uh, and that was actually from Robert Enriquez's witness that I was able to find the first-hand account. Um, the second day, Patton goes down onto the beach to, to, to work the craft, and his first order of the war was to stop the troops landing on the beach and have them land in the port where they could get it w without getting wet. Well, he comes down to the beach the next day, and they're still landing on the beach, so he's furious. So he goes into the surf, waist deep, you know, trying to direct people. A, a ship overturns, you have to take dead bodies out of the water. So you can see his pants are wet from this. Now this is, he handed his camera to Enriquez and said, take some pictures of me. Um, he liked this photograph so much. This is one of the first ones he sends home to Beatrice. And he says, this picture of me is so good, we should make it a magazine cover. So here he is with a whole 24 hours of battle under his belt, and he's already got himself on the cover of Life magazine. So I always thought that was pretty impressive. Um, the battle lasts three days. He takes... Uh, Morocco on November 11th. He says, this is a great birthday present for me. Uh, the, the French surrender before the attack commences. And so Patton goes from, you know, a, a Western task force commander to sort of a civil, civilian military uh, district manager. Uh, he's in charge of the whole Western side of North Africa. He, the troops are coming in, supplies. He's making sure everybody is trained, uh, deals with a lot of drunken soldiers that get in his face and yell at him, and he makes sure they go right off the jail. Um, he says it was mostly Air Force guys that were complaining. It was the, the infantry guys kind of kept themselves wired tight, but it was the Air Force guys who didn't like the discomforts of North Africa that did the most complaining. Um, if you've seen the movie Patton, uh, there is a, a scene in the beginning where he gets an award from what's believed to be the Pasha of Morocco, and it's an old man, and he says, you know, the, the lions in their den tremble at his, at his approach. And that was actually written on the back of the medal in French. But everybody, you know, if you look at the photographs, the official army photographs, this gentleman is in them, and the photographer assumed that that was the Persia, the, the, the Persia of Morocco. He's not. He's the grand advisor, and this is the uh, the, the Pasha's uh, son. And so that was a l very long-held uh, mistake historically, was that this is the leader, and I think they just assumed because he was old that he was. Um, Patton would go on fishing trips with the Pasha. He would go for dinners and lunches, and he hated it. You know, it was a lot of ceremony, uh, and it was not war. You know, the war is going on in Tunisia. He wants to be a part of it. 
uh, but he feels like he's been left behind and forgotten. Um, luckily for Patton, the Germans attack at Kazarine Pass and change the whole dynamic of what's going on. Eisenhower realizes his core commander at the time, uh, Frindahl, uh, just doesn't have it anymore. He's, he's got a cave as a headquarters about 40 miles behind the front lines. Uh, he's ineffective. When they send a, a, a tank commander, uh, uh, I think it was, uh, Ernie Harmon, to, to go check on the situation, he says, okay, Harmon, you're in charge. Take it over for me. And I mean, just no initiative. Uh, and Eisenhower actually offers Harmon the job of Second Corps, and he says, I can't take the job of a guy I just said should be relieved. And so they next offer it to uh, Mark Clark, who says, well, I'm the commander of Fifth Army. That would be a demotion. I really can't do it. And they offer it to Pat, and he goes, you know, where do I sign? You know, l let, let me add him. And um, it's at that point that Eisenhower, you know, reminds him. He says, listen, you're very important to this war effort, George. I need a corps commander, not a casualty. Don't be going up to the front all the time. We need you to, you know, stay in your place and, and win this war. Um, I'm going to backtrack for just a second. Right before this happens, Patton was actually driving in the desert, and he comes across this soldier, who is his son-in-law, John Waters. His oldest daughter, uh, Little B, named after Beatrice, married John Waters in Massachusetts. He was a battalion commander with the 1st Armored Division. And when Patton saw him, he said he had a bullet hole in his jacket, and he looked tired but good. And if you notice, there are some like spots here at the top. That's the actual glue Patton was using to put it into the photo album. So this is, an act this is the last photograph taken of John Waters before he is captured a few days later at Kazarine Pass. He's going to spend the rest of the war in POW camps in Germany. And when the book, my book came out, I contacted Joanne Patton, uh, Patton's daughter-in-law, and she said, you know, I'm about to go see the Waters family, and there's pictures you have of their father and grandfather that they've never seen. And so they weren't even aware that this photograph existed. Um, so with Kazarine Pass, Patton takes command of the, the Second Corps. Um, he, you know, tightens up the discipline really fast. Within 10 days, he's got Second Corps moving forward again. Uh, you know, it, just like in the movie, he was very big on the shoe polishing and things like that. But man, he could be severe. He comes across a group of soldiers walking back from the front, and one of them is wearing a British jacket because he says it was warmer than an American one. Patton has his driver pull over, calls the guy over, says, take the jacket off. The guy takes it off, says, give it to me, takes it, and Patton starts slapping him in the face back and forth with the jacket. Then he throws the jacket at the guy, orders his lieutenant to give him a shovel, and makes him bury it. And then he tells the lieutenant, if this guy doesn't have an American jacket on tomorrow, I'm going to demote you and charge him $20 for wearing a British jacket, and I'll be back tomorrow. Now, every time he disciplined somebody, he would always finish by saying, I'll be back tomorrow. I don't know if he ever was, but I think that was that last seed he'd plant in their brains, like, yeah, we better do this. So, um, you know, his discipline was quite draconian. You know, in a lot of ways, Second Corps needed this. They had gotten a bloody nose from the Germans. They, had, they were very demoralized. And, you know, different commanders have different methods. This was Patton's. Um, he's proud of it, and a lot of the soldiers become proud of it. To be hit by Patton is like a badge of honor. You know, he, he slaps a, uh, a Navy guy on the first day of Operation Torch, and, I, and the guy got back on the boat and bragged, I got hit by General Patton. So nobody's saying, like, boy, this might lead somewhere bad. You know, this is accepted uh, behavior by George S. Patton. Um, in the movie Patton, you, you might be familiar with the fact that his assistant, uh, not Charles Conrad, but Dick Jensen gets killed when a bomb, a German bomb drops and the concussion kills him. In both Patton's letters, I, uh, Bradley's do, uh, memoir, and Bradley's assistant's letters, they all say that uh, Dick, uh, Dick Jensen had been ordered by Patton to go off to something called Benson Force. And while he was there, the Germans attacked, Bradley was there, the assistant was there, they saw him get killed by the bomb, you know, the bomb that gets dropped. Uh, about a year ago, I found an account by a soldier that I believe is true because I've got proof to back it up, who said that was all a lie, that Patton, on his own, decided to move his headquarters closer to the front. Um, this guy's name was Bob Cohn, and he was a Jeep driver for the scout car for Patton's entourage. And they said they all drove out into the desert near El Guitar. They had all these wires coming from their car. They said, boy, we are a perfect target if the Germans could see. They know, when they see, you know, antennas, they know it's somebody in charge. And they set up near a ridge, and Patton orders this guy to go up the ridge and see if there's any Germans. Well, he starts to go up the ridge, and enemy artillery starts falling. 
So he comes running back, and Patton says, you idiot. You got on the top of that ridge, and the Germans saw you. He said, no, sir, I got halfway up. They're already up top. And Patton says, now nah, you're lying. About a half hour later, a bunch of German bombers fly over. They let loose. This guy, um, Cohen, gets in the, the scout car, fires, knocks one of them down. And, uh, but they're bombed the whole time. And he says, one of the bombs drops real close to Dick Jensen and kills him. And Patton is so shook up, they have to help him get into his car. And this guy, Cohn, and Bradley's assistant put Dick Jensen in, in a, another car and bring him back you know, to bury him. And you know, Patton and Bradley's and the assistant's uh, stories are all very similar, but they all have a few differences in all of them. I, I picked that up very quickly. And Patton wrote a letter to his wife saying, Dick Jensen was killed today, and I didn't have the heart to tell his parents why. And I was like, OK, there's another clue. And what I came to realize uh, through my book, Patton's Photographs, I didn't know this when I wrote the book, Patton has a number of photographs of Dick Jensen, and he says, on the day he died. Now, Jensen was about 50 miles from Patton's headquarters, and his watch stopped at 10.15 when he was killed. So how did Patton take this guy's picture if he was at the front, and Patton was back at his headquarters on the day he died? And this picture here is Al Stiller, one of his assistants, standing in the shell hole of the German bomb, and this is the trench that Dick Jensen was in when he was killed. Um, so it is my belief that Patton was close. And he, what Patton said was, if Eisenhower finds out that I was this close to the enemy, he's going to send me home. And so Cohn, who had shot down a German plane, and Patton said, I'm going to give you a silver star for that, never gets a medal. You know, the, the whole incident is, is forgotten about. Uh, and, they, and it said that he was killed at Benson Force. And, it was, and Patton said, I sent him to Benson Force because they were short on staff officers. And Bradley's assistant, who went with him, the next day after this incident, talks about how he went behind, you know, went to the rear and, and was buying flowers and candy. And I'm thinking, well, if they went to the front because they were desperate on officers, why is this guy back the next day, you know, behind the lines, goofing around? So that's the story of uh, Captain Jensen. So from North Africa, Patton goes to Sicily, and lands in the southern part of it. Uh, it's very popular in the movie that he wanted to land at Palermo on the top and have the British land in the south and cut it off. But I was reading a British RAF officer who was in charge of the code breaking. And he said they briefed Patton about two months beforehand, said the Germans have concentrated their troops in Palermo. It's unwise to land there. And Patton said, you're right. So it wasn't the kind of great controversy that the movie makes. So here he is landing in uh, the, the Jella, is the way they pronounce it over there, in southern Sicily. And he said that this is not a posed photograph. I don't know if I believe him. Um, but he said he could hear the machine gun fire you know, in the distance and artillery. That's how close the front was. And this African-American soldier, it's not George Meeks, he said that this guy had gone AWOL from his unit because he knew Patton in his younger years and wanted to serve with him in Sicily. Um, Patton's 7th Army, he's in charge of 7th Army at this point, starts pushing up uh, the spine of Sicily and is headed towards Palermo. This is a dead German. Patton, in his photo albums, called this a good German. And he took so many pictures of dead Germans that he just started writing GG underneath for good German. And he said the Germans would booby trap the dead bodies, uh, uh, which he said that his soldiers did not like, and the result was less German prisoners taken. So I think the, the American soldiers stopped risking anything at that point. Um, this is a very interesting photograph that Patton took. You know, it, a lot of the stuff he takes is of, of ancient ruins or of the troops, you know, of different things. But this, look at this. At, at the top here is an arrow, and at the bottom, right about there, is another arrow. And what he did is he looked at this German tank and said, you know what, the Germans are adding more armor to the front and in front of the machine gun. We need to do the same. So he took these pictures, put the arrows on it, and mailed this to Aberdeen Proving Grounds in Maryland and said, guys, we need to do this. So not only is photography sort of a hobby of his, it, it has a practical aspect to it. This is his uh, headquarters in Palermo. Um, it was, a, it, was, it was previously occupied by um, some of Mussolini's troops and commanders. And Patton said he slept on a stack of three mattresses in the bedroom, uh, ate off Saxony silverware, and all of the maids and butlers gave him the fascist salute everywhere he went. And he loved that. He thought that was great. Um, so basically, with taking Palermo, he splits Sicily in half. The British are having trouble. General Montgomery is having trouble pushing north. He's actually traveled north, cut the island in half, so now he's going to start heading east uh, to Messina to cut it off. And the Germans, you know, very experienced soldiers, they know what they're doing. 
they realize that he's along a coast with one road. So if they can just keep blocking the road, they can stop him or slow him down. So to get around this, he starts landing amphibious attacks behind the lines. Uh, first a place called Santa Gata, and then Brolo. Uh, this is the commander of both of those uh, amphibious attacks. And it's very famous in the movie that this shows Patton sort of at his worst, very pushing everybody, firing people to get to the beaches. And there was a reporter with this unit, uh, and they make it out like, you know, Patton was very heartless and it was a stupid idea because it didn't work. And, but if you study the military records of it, what actually happened is they landed at night, they just missed him at Santa Gata. And so Patton said, let's try this again and we'll see if we can get a lot of Germans between the two forces. So they land at Brolo at night, they climb up this gigantic hill, I have no idea how they did this, and set up artillery guns and things like that, and started firing down on the Germans as the Germans are retreating in front of them. Then the Navy comes in with its big guns and they start radioing in fire from the Navy. Now this is the really effective part, the, the big naval guns. And they basically have the Germans perfectly, you know, hammer and anvil. And in the middle of all this, the radio breaks down. They can't contact the Navy. And the Naval commander gets a little worried. He says, you know, here we're standing out here. The German Luftwaffe could be attacking us any second. And the Navy leaves. Uh, the Germans attack these guys up the hill. They just retreat further north. And the Germans realize it's more in their interest to escape east than to attack this group. So they basically leave them alone. Um, but Patton eventually does break through. But the, the, the sort of popular image was that this was an ill-fated attack. It was ill-advised. But in reality, you know, if they had brought two radios, it may have been sort of a, another great Patton victory. Uh, Patton said he loved the attitude of his 7th Army troops. He said they would be sitting by dead German bodies eating their lunch. And here's a photograph. This guy's actually taking a picture of Patton, taking a picture of him. And you have a group of uh, Italian prisoners here on the side of the road. Um, and he takes a great deal of photographs in, in Sicily. I think he's, at this point, he feels more at ease with command. Uh, you know, in North Africa, it was all kind of thrust upon him. But he's becoming more and more comfortable. And early on, he takes photographs of destroyed German vehicles way off the battlefield. As he gets more comfortable as a commander, he's taking photographs closer and closer to combat. Um, unfortunately, with his victory comes a visit to a hospital where he slaps two soldiers on two separate occasions. I did find an account by an American who was, a prison, uh, uh, was wounded in one of the tents, and he said they all saw his vehicle pull up, and they were all sitting in there for about 15 minutes, and then a nurse ran into their wing and said, my God, General Patton just slapped a soldier. And they all saw Patton leaving, and they all applauded. And they said to them, it was like he was slapping everyone in America in the face, saying, there's a war going on, wake up. Um, that's one angle of it. Every medic I've talked to uh, from World War II said it was a terrible thing. That, you know, they didn't understand post-traumatic stress. They didn't understand what combat would do to people. And what he did was an awful, awful, unforgivable thing. So there are definitely two sides to the, the slapping incident. Um, so for that, Patton loses command. He's still commander of 7th Army, but they take all the units away. I mean, either bring him to England to fight, you know, for Normandy or into Italy. And so on his birthday, November 11th, Veterans Day, in Sicily, he visits a cemetery for the 2nd Armored Division. And so here he is with Hap Gay, his uh, chief of staff. And he says, one year ago, you know, I took Morocco. And today I command a little more than my self-respect. Um, now this next series of photographs, this is three of my favorite. While he's in exile, he travels around the Mediterranean, visiting different places. And he goes over to Italy to visit Geoffrey Keyes, who was a commander underneath him in Sicily. And, uh, and it's in January, so that's Geoffrey Keyes and that's Patton. So Geoffrey Keyes gives Patton a tour of the battlefront. And they're walking along a ridge when Patton turns to his right and he sees down into this field artillery guns firing. Now, I have tried and tried. I can't find the guns, but you can definitely see smoke uh, coming from them. And so he turns to his right, takes this photograph, and he says, this photograph saved my life. Because if I had not stopped to take this picture, I would have continued walking, and a German artillery barrage lands 30 feet in front of him. Uh, he said a whole bunch of shrapnel came at him. Some of it, one of it hit his shoe. Uh, another guy with his entourage gets hit in the helmet. But he said that, you know, this photograph prevented him from, being, from standing right here where the German shells landed. And he said, this is a sign from God that I am destined for greater things and I've got to keep the faith. Don't get depressed, you know. A few days later, he gets notification from Eisenhower to come up to England. He's going to be part of the next great offensive. Uh, while in England, he buys a dog named Punch. 
And I really hope that's a little rabbit, not a, not a rat. Um, and Punch had been owned by an RAF pilot who actually took him on a raid over Berlin. Patton renames him Willie. Uh, the popular thing is that he named him after William the Conqueror. He didn't. There was a popular song back in the 20s called like Wee Willy Wampa or something like that. And that's what he really named him for. The other stereotype of Willie is that he was a coward. I have not found any physical evidence of this at all in any documents. The only thing I've found is that during an artillery barrage, Willie ducked underneath a chair. And I think that's more of a sign of intelligence than, than being a coward. Um, Patton would actually write letters to, uh, well, I mean, how do I phrase this? Willie would actually write letters to the Patton's other dog back in Massachusetts. Patton would translate. And um, Beatrice would get these letters and read them to the grandkids. And, you know, I guess by 1940 standards, they were fine. But today, you know, he said, you know, hey, I've got a whole bunch of new nicknames for myself. Jap killer, you know, and Hun destroyer, and all these really politically incorrect terms that were really funny. So, uh, and th that letter was sent during the Battle of the Bulge. And I thought, what, how great that is. And here he is fighting the, probably the greatest land war, you know, in American history. And he's, you know, writing letters from one dog to another at night, you know, in his free time. Um, Patton's headquarters is up near a place called Nutsford in northern England. And they open a uh, cantina, so to speak, for the soldiers to meet the locals and things like that. And it's in here that Patton uh, goes to give a speech. And uh, according to a lot of popular accounts, you know, he says that because the, the Americans and the British and the Russians are destined to rule the world, the post-war world, the better we get to know each other, you know, the better for everything. Um, one of the newspapers that publishes this speech fails to put the word Russians in there. Uh, it causes a firestorm back at home, and not even because of failing to mention the Russians, it's because here's a general talking politics, and he has no place talking about this. Eisenhower's furious. He gets, he's basically thinking about firing Patton. Martin Blumenson, the, uh, the original Patton historian, he was working on something before he died, and I have not been able to verify it, but it was his belief, because whenever Patton spoke in England to the troops, that famous speech he gives, he would always start it and end it saying, I was not here, you did not see me. Because Patton was undercover as part of something called Operation Fortitude, making the Germans think we were going to invade a place called Pas de Calais, not Normandy, and Patton was going to lead it. So when he would go around giving these talks, he'd say, you didn't see me, I wasn't here, because it was supposed to all be sort of under the rug. Well, here he goes to speak you know, off the record, and it makes it into the newspapers. So Eisenhower's doubly furious. He's like, you're supposed to keep a low profile, and you and your big mouth, you know, you're out there talking. Well, Blumenson started doing some research, and what he believed, his theory, was that the British SAS, the British Secret Service, basically, decided to out Patton because they wanted the Germans to know he was there and might lead the invasion. And how ironic would it be that the British are pulling this thing, making the publicity, and Eisenhower not realizing it and almost relieving Patton of command. So in the movie, he, do, he does that speech outside uh, in front of a large red brick building. That's actually a furniture store, and they say they do get a lot of American visitors asking about it. Uh, the actual building is about, about four blocks down, and it's now a law office. You can't go in. They said they've gutted the whole thing, so you really couldn't find the place where he gives the speech. But I also thought it was odd that the speech that almost takes him down, he puts a picture of it in his photo albums. You know, like, there, here's my worst moment, everybody. So... Um, so eventually that, you know, controversy blows over. He makes it onto the continent a month later, uh, spends a lot of his time uh, in an apple orchard uh, where he set up a headquarters, uh, just waiting for Third Army to be activated. He's waiting for the divisions to come in, the armored divisions to come in. Uh, he's going to take over on August 1st, but spends a lot of his time planning and, and preparing for it. Uh, I think he did lose some weight between his time in exile and this, because he does look a bit skinny here, and he does get a bit of a belly by 45. Um, while he's waiting to take command, uh, Omar Bradley orders an operation called Cobra, where American bombers are going to come and do what's called a tactical bombing. Instead of bombing factories you know, in Germany, they're going to bomb the line between the Germans and the Americans and just wipe out the Germans so we can sort of break out of this stalemate we're in. A number of, uh, more than 100 Americans are killed when the bombs fall short. But right after it, Bradley and Patton go airborne to go check out you know, the effects. And so Patton is taking a photograph of Bradley from his plane. At one time, Patton did go airborne and crossed over onto German lines. And, and you know, he freaked out to the pilot. He said, we can never do that. Eisenhower will leave me immediately. 
Uh, but Patton was a licensed pilot, and he would go up in airplanes. In fact, when Third Army was training in England, he would fly a fighter plane above them, the troops, so they would be able to look up and identify, okay, that's an American plane. We don't fire on that one. And he takes a number of photographs of the troops down below. Um, August 1st, Third Army becomes operational, and it basically is going to sweep across the southern part of northern France, uh, barreling through a lot of non-resistance, and it's going to end up capturing, making a bag of Germans in what's called the fillet pocket. Um, so here is Patton, Eisenhower, Bradley, and then Courtney Hodges, because when the invasion of Normandy begins, Omar Bradley is commander of what's called First Army. And the plan is, once there are enough troops in Normandy, then they would have a Third Army, and Hodges would take over first from Bradley. Bradley would be promoted to Army Group Commander. And so you can sort of tell what... But where we are in the war because Hodges is here and he's got the first army patch on his shoulder. Um, Patton races to an area of France called Lorraine, which is close to the German border. This is where he's going to run out of fuel. Um, and here he is waiting for Eisenhower to come to his headquarters. You can see he's all spit and polished and everything. And that's his uh, 20th Corps commander, Walker, who's going to later fight in Korea, and our good friend Willie down here. Um, several reasons. Patton races across France and suddenly slows and stops. Uh, and to, to him, it's because Eisenhower likes Montgomery more and is giving him all the fuel. Uh, but that's not the fact. Everybody's running out of fuel. They're outrunning their supply lines. And it's really a combination of not just that, but also the fact that the terrain, which has been basically flat, is now going to turn hilly and forestry, uh, more rivers harder to cross. Uh, the rains start coming in, turning the roads to mud. And lastly, the army kind of splits. Uh, as it breaks out of Normandy, because Bradley and Eisenhower really want to open up the ports and get more supplies in, so they dedicate a lot of the air power to attacking these isolated pockets along the French coast. So Patton, as he moves across France, by the time he gets into the Lorraine area, has a lot less air support uh, going along with the bad terrain and the lack of fuel. Um, he crosses the Moselle River in September and climbs into this trench uh, with the troops in the mud, and he said that across the river, they, he watched uh, three American tanks take on two Germans. They knocked the two German tanks out. He said the two German tanks were on fire. And he said you could tell when the Germans and the Americans were firing because of the different rates of fire of the machine guns. So this is how close to the battle Patton gets. He can actually hear the rates of machine gun fire between the Americans and the enemy. Um, with the army kind of stopped, he does spend a lot of time going behind the line, making sure that men are getting the proper equipment, food, uh, trying to cover all the details. Uh, there's not a day. He, his morning started around 5 a.m. with a briefing. And they said that uh, the briefing, everyone was so nervous because Patton was so cognizant of what was going on that if you made mistakes, he'd know it. And he would spend the part of the morning at his headquarters planning the day's events and then head into the field. And what he would do is he would take his command car and sometimes stand up in the front and drive to the front because he always wanted the men to see him driving forward. And then when he finished examining the front, he would have a plane either take him back or he would you know, put a blanket over him for the ride back behind lines. He did not want his men to see him retreating ever. Uh, this I thought was a great example of Patton's humor. Uh, George Marshall comes to visit him in October and uh, someone took this photograph and I think Patton kind of improved on it. Um, November 11th, Patton's birthday, 1944. He said he got up where the bodies were still warm. Uh, Third Army was having a hard time crossing the Moselle River. They created three bridges. They all get washed out. This is more weather than the Germans, uh, you know, stopping him. Uh, but they do cross at a place called Petit Etange. And um, Patton, you know, this is his shadow right here, taking this photograph. And the Germans attacked, and were leading off with, with an ST gun. And the American 90th Infantry Division stops them. And the officer in charge, they, they rolled up a cannon to a street intersection and knocked this thing off the road. And the, one time when I was there, my, my assistant tour guide is a retired one-star general named Raymond Bell, whose father fought right here and rolled up that gun. And there's a plaque to his dad. And while we were talking about it, I had my book with me. And I said, you know, Ray, is it possible that this is the gun your dad knocked out? And so we sort of walked out of the town and walked up the street and turned to the left, and the terrain looked almost identical. So can't prove it, but uh, kind of cool. Um, this is Patton during the bulge. He actually went blind one day because he spent so much time outside in the cold, and the, the, the snow was blowing left and right that his eyes swelled up. And so he did have to spend one day off the battlefield. 
but um, there's a very famous scene on uh, December 19th. The Germans attack on the 16th, and Eisenhower calls a meeting at a place called Verdun on the uh, 19th. And before Patton goes, he reviews three plans with his troops, and I just found this out. They were called Cent, Dime, and Nickel. And um, Cent was the drive to Bastogne, Dime was to knock it out at the nose, and Nickel was to cut it off at the base. And so when the meeting was over, he said, well, what'll happen is I'll go to this meeting and all I have to do is pick up the phone and say dime, cent, or nickel, and the whole thing will start happening. So, you know, he has this meeting at 10 a.m., goes to the meeting in Verdun at 12, and about 12.30 makes the call, and his staff had been working on all three plans the whole time. And that's what started the entire Third Army turn north to relieve Bastogne. Um, Eisenhower had just gotten word that he was gonna get a fifth star, uh, you know, the day before. And so they go to Verdun for this meeting and he kind of goes around the chairs and says, okay, what's going on? And everybody says, as soon as this snow clears, we can send up reconnaissance aircraft and we'll give you great details, you know? And when he gets to Patton, he says, well, George, what can you do? And he says, well, I can turn north and in 48 hours, or 72 hours, I can turn north and start attacking north. And uh, Eisenhower says, George, don't be fascist, you know, fascist, don't, don't kid with me. And Patton says, no, I got three divisions ready to go. And Eisenhower's like, well, that's good. What else you got? And he goes, well, in another 48, I can turn three more divisions and attack north. And he said, what about your southern flank? And he goes, I already talked to the commander of the southern flank. He'll take it over. This is Patton's glory moment, you know, with Eisenhower. And um, when the whole meeting is over, Eisenhower turns him and says, George, you know, every time I get promoted, I get attacked. Because when he got his third story, he got attacked at Kazarin Pass. And Patton says, yeah, and every time you get attacked, I bail you out. And with that, the Verdun meeting was over with, and uh, Patton begins his charge north into Bastogne. Now, this is Patton. Patton switched headquarters after that meeting. He did not go back to his regular one. Eisenhower said, go to Luxembourg City, set up a headquarters there, coordinate with Bradley. This is now an old folks home, and there is a little black plaque right by the door that tells you that this is Patton's headquarters during the entire Battle of the Bulge. And I talked to one officer who told me that all the floors in there were hardwood, and there was nothing more terrifying than hearing this click, 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 click on the wooden floors because it meant Willie, the dog, was coming down the hall, which meant Patton was coming down the hall to chew you out for something. And so everybody lived in terror of Willie, uh, Willie's approach. Um, Patton took this photograph on January 22nd, and you can see his finger is in front of the lens. I originally thought that was his thumb, but the people at the Patton Museum let me hold the camera. Um, he said that uh, he took a number of pictures of dead this day, and his only regret was that he didn't have his color camera because this, Germ this dead German's face was such an interesting claret pale color. So something that would kind of make us recoil, Patton is, is relishing in, that kind of gives you an idea where his head's at. Um, this picture took me a while to understand because it's obviously taken in the summer and it's not taken during wartime because if you notice, they're not really wearing helmets, they're wearing something called helmet liners, which is what you put on underneath your helmet. Patton sent this photograph to his wife and said, during the Battle of the Bulge, I crossed a bridge similar to this, stepping over dead bodies along the way, and this is the River Sur. And I don't know why he would use, because usually he would always send pictures of what he was doing, but this obviously is, is summertime and probably in the United States. Well, a rumor had broken out about Patton that he had actually swum the Sur River under fire. And Patton never mentions it in his diaries or letters or anything, uh, but I found three eyewitness accounts that said uh, the 4th Infantry Division was trying to cross the Sur River. Uh, I think it was, uh, the town was like Bettenston or something like that, Bettendorf. And the engineers came to him and said, sir, there's too much enemy fire. We can't, you know, begin building a bridge across. And they said he took off his guns, he took off his coat, he stripped down, swam the river, swam back, and said, okay, what's your excuse now? Uh, 64 years old, George is, when he does this. Uh, talking to 20 and 19 year olds. Um, I actually brought this information to the director of the museum close by in a place called Dekirk. And he said, well, January 22nd, there would have been ice flows in the river, Kevin. And he said, I can't believe he did it because he never even spoke about it. But I showed him the three eyewitness accounts. One of them was a newspaper article, AP, pa uh, AP news article that Beatrice had cut out when it came out, who, the guy said he witnessed it. Um, he later said, Bob Hope found this out and said they were gonna start putting ice cubes in the West Point pool to start training the cadets to swim in the cold. Um, the second was a letter left at Patton's grave 
that someone had opened and, and published in a paper and Beatrice found that and put it in a scrapbook. And then the third account I found at the Library of Congress under a, a veterans history program where they interviewed vets and all of the stories were similar. So uh, something that was a bit of a rumor is now fact. So that, and I think the reason he did this because he didn't want his wife to worry, to know that he was swimming these rivers under fire. So he sends her a picture, look at the, oh, nice calm, you know, we could have been fishing, you know. Um, Patton gets into Germany and he says, this is the worst destruction he saw driving along a road here. Uh, I think it was four miles of destroyed vehicles. And what happened was elements of the 12th Armored Division basically came up on a German retreating column and just turned their guns sideways and basically blew them off the road. Uh, Patton said by the time he got there, there were no dead bodies, but unfortunately there were a lot of dead horses, which made him upset. I believe this is the commander of his air forces right here. His name escapes me right now, but he's taken a nice photo. Um, uh, the fun one. Uh, this is Patton crossing the Rhine River. Uh, he's about to do something here. Um, but he has his assistant take a photograph, a clean photograph that he can send to his wife. Uh, and in about five seconds, he's gonna relieve himself in the river. Uh, I know this for a fact, it's in my book, uh, because the photograph of him actually doing it, uh, this photograph was taken by Charles Codman, his assistant. And so what happened was Codman snapped this picture and then turns to walk away when someone behind Codman snaps the picture. So you see Patton doing his thing and Codman holding the camera. So I know the exact sequence that these were taken. Um, he called it the pause that refreshes. Um, when he gets to the other side of the river, he gets out of his vehicle and kind of, I don't know if he pretends to fall down, if he really falls down, but he falls down and he comes up with two handfuls of dirt and says, hence William of Orange. And what he's doing there is kind of reenacting what William of Orange did when he took a ship and went to invade England he went to get out of his boat and fell and came up with two handfuls of sand and said, thus I have taken England with both hands. And so I think that is nicely reflective of Patton's appreciation of history. Um, I had mentioned John Waters before who had been captured. Well, John spends the rest of the war in a POW camp. On March 23rd, after crossing the Rhine, Patton realizes that Third Army is right in line with the POW camp where they believe he is, but Third Army gets orders to move northeast and he realizes he's not going to be able to liberate the town. So he puts together an ad hoc force of 4th Armored Division tanks and trucks and says, bust through the line, get behind the German lines, rescue this camp, and bring everybody back. And people are like, is he doing this to rescue the soldiers or is he trying to get his son-in-law back? Well, Patton orders one of his assistants who knows John Waters to partake in it so that you know, he'll be able to identify him and make sure they get him out of there. Doesn't work to Patton's advantage. He also doesn't order any air cover for this attack. I think that's very telling, that he's trying to keep this thing secret, you know. He says one of the reasons was that uh, MacArthur had done a great rescue of a POW camp behind the lines in the Philippines, and I think he wanted to do something similar. I think it really was about John Waters. So these troops make it to the camp. They liberate it. They think there's going to be about 300 guys there. There's about 5,000. The Germans obviously are overcrowding in their prisons. And John Waters goes out the gate, and a panicky German guard shoots him in the butt. So they got to bring him back into the hospital, you know, I'm sorry, back into the prison, into the prison hospital, uh, where he's going to remain. Patton feels incredibly guilty about this. Um, the next morning, they go to leave the camp, this rescue force, and the Germans had surrounded overnight and just poured artillery fire on him. It was called Task Force Bomb. Bomb had to surrender. Um, big black eye for Third Army. Patton, you know, they do kind of cover it up. Bradley realizes how bad Patton feels about it, says, you know, there's no punishment needed. You're punishing yourself enough for it. About two weeks later, they finally liberate John Waters. So this is John in a hospital in Frankfurt. And you can see he looks very hollow cheeks. I mean, he's definitely been living the, the, the poor life for the last four years. But Patton said when he visited him, he had had some potato soup and was feeling better. He's getting his energy back. But I like to use the story of John Waters to talk about sort of a larger facet of war. Um, you know, a lot of people talk about the stress on soldiers in combat, and then, then and that, you know, has its place. But it is also kind of like throwing a rock in a pond. There's an there's a effect larger than that. Um, and the reason I bring this up is, you know, John was married to Patton's oldest daughter. And um, in 1952, John goes off to fight in Korea, and B, little B dies of a heart attack. And so Patton's wife, Beatrice, comes to her place to, you know, get the furniture and every, clear everything out. And behind every bookcase and drawer and, and everything, they just find liquor bottle after liquor bottle. And they 
realized she had been a closet alcoholic. And the Patton family believed that started with the capture of her husband in Tunisia, that that's how she dealt with the stress. And so I always think that is a, a perfect microcosm to the larger stress that, that combat brings to everyone. Now this is what's called Mooseburg Prison, and this is where they brought a lot of the prisoners uh, when, when the failed raid uh, on John Waters Prison takes place. The Germans move a lot into Mooseburg. So Patton rolls in here a few weeks later, and the troops just go nuts. They're so happy they've been liberated. They really identify that Patton is their liberator because he comes in after a few tanks come crashing through the fence. Um, and Patton said it was a bittersweet moment because here they're just praising him to, to high glory, but yet he writes in his diary, he said, if I hadn't launched that raid, these guys wouldn't have been stuck here all these extra weeks. Um, he climbs up on a tank and gives them a speech. He says, don't go running into the countryside, eating whatever you want, doing whatever your bodies can't take it. And one more thing, stay out of my way. I'm still killing Germans. And they loved it. Um, a good example of, of research, and what's kind of sometimes the things you find out when you finish your research is just as interesting as what you find out during your research. When my book came out, I got a call from this gentleman right here and said, you know, I was in that picture. I remember Patton rolling in. He said it was two Jeeps and a tank, and I believe this crowd of men here is the actual tank. Um, but he said he, the first person Patton shook hands with was a British RAO, RAF officer, Royal Air Force officer. And so I noticed when I looked at the picture that that guy's not wearing an American hat. That is a British officer's hat, so I, I assume that's him. But, you know, that's the kind of stuff that kind of brings history alive. You know, you deal with documents and pictures and things like that, and then you got people coming to you and saying, I remember that, you know. And then your fear is that they tell you you got it wrong, but he didn't. Um, with the war, when the war ends, uh, Patton is actually in Czechoslovakia. Um, he is just bored. He misses the war. Uh, but he's asked to come home on a war, bond, war bonds tour. So he goes back to what's called Green Meadows, Massachusetts, where he and Beatrice lived, and visits with his grandkids, uh, gives a number of war bond speeches, gets in a little bit of trouble, because uh, he's speaking with wounded veterans on his left and his right. And he says, you know, people always pray praise those who died in war. Well, the, these guys here are just as big as heroes as those who were dead. And a lot of people took offense to that. You know, they said he was belittling the, the memory of the dead. But of course, in Patton's mind, he wasn't. He was praising the, the ones that were wounded. Um, but he says in his speech, he said two things. He said that everything was odd when he flew over Boston, when he arrived. He said, all the houses had roofs. All the bridges were complete. You know, this looks nothing like Europe. You know, this is odd. This is so odd. And then in the middle of his speech, he was talking about something. He goes, you know, when I was younger, I weighed a lot less. And the whole audience laughs. He goes, what are you laughing about? I got more brains now. You know, so he, he definitely had fun talking in front of people. Um, this is the last photograph Patton ever took. Uh, after he goes to the United States, he goes back to Europe. And he kind of spends a nostalgia tour across Europe of all the places he liberated. They're giving him medals everywhere he goes. And he goes up to Stockholm, Sweden, where he was in the Olympics. And he actually meets up with some of his fellow Olympians, and they have a pistol shoot, and he wins. And so they said, wow, George, in 1945, you won the 1912 Olympics. Um, the Swedish army puts on a drill, a precision drill motorcycle team, uh, goes through some paces for him, and he whips out his photo camera, and he takes this photograph. Ten days later, he's going to be in a car accident that's going to break his neck uh, and result in his death. So the army sends the camera home, and Beatrice develops the last roll of film and wrote underneath this photograph in the photo albums, this is the last picture my husband took. So that's the majority of, of the sort of chronology. Now, there's a few things, I, some photographs I've taken I just want to kind of share with you. This is where Patton had the famous car accident. Where this car is is where the truck that hit him uh, was, and he was traveling this way, you know, towards the, the horizon, and the truck is going to turn into this sort of driveway here, this little red brick building, and that's where they hit. And what happened was there were two trucks, and there was a railroad uh, train crossing right here. And on the other side were two trucks. The first truck stalled out. second truck pulled out from behind. So the second truck didn't see what was in front of him until it was too late. Uh, the accident happened about 35 miles an hour. Patton is the only one hurt, breaks two vertebrae in his neck, um, tells uh, Hap Gay, who's in the car with him, he says, I think I'm paralyzed, rub my fingers. And so Gay starts rubbing his fingers. He said, I said, I think I'm paralyzed, rub my fingers. And that's when Hap Gay realizes how bad Patton is. And he tells the uh, MP officer at the intersection, you're in charge, take command of everything. Um, there have been a lot of rumors that, you know, that this was a conspiracy, that someone shot him on the side of the neck with the OSS. It's all bunk. Um, 
the, uh, the big conspiracy theory, there was a show on the History Channel recently about it. Some guy's written a book called Target Pat, and I actually helped him with some of his research. Uh, his theory is that the KGB had captured some OSS officers, and they told Bill Donovan, we'll give them back if you kill Patton, because Patton wants World War III with Russia. I got news for you. Every other general in the U.S. Army wanted World War III with Russia at the end of World War II. Just Patton's the one they always focus on. Um, so the deal was that this OSS guy was standing on the side of the road, and he was going to shoot some sort of special air gun that was going to hit Patton in the head and kill him. <sighs> Why he would be rolling, driving with the window down on December 20th, uh, or December 9th, I have no idea. Um, and so when that failed, they bring him to a hospital in Heidelberg, and this is the actual room. It's now an X-ray room at an American army base. Um, and the Russians squirted some sort of poisonous gas through the window that was going to kill Patton. Of course, there was a nurse in the room every second that Patton was there, so exactly how they did it, I don't know. Um, I think it's that same thing you know you see with JFK, where it's somebody of such great importance that a simple car accident just can't do this. You know, um, he did linger. I shouldn't even say linger because he was actually his voice was energetic and everything for those those nine days or nine ten days in between. And if he had seen somebody shoot him, Patton, pretty smart guy, I think he would have noticed it. Um, but he spent his time. Uh, Beatrice flew in from Boston. Uh, uh, he died on December twentieth, nineteen forty-five. He never made it to forty-six. And his plan was to come home to Green Meadows and actually turn it into a museum. That was his, he had actually had some Army engineers sketch plans for what it would look like. But he ends up dying here in Heidelberg. Uh, then a debate ensues, you know, where should Patton be buried? Well, obviously back home in Arlington Cemetery um, or back at his, you know, estate. And the French government offers to bury him with Napoleon, Napoleon's tomb. Uh, there's a number of French generals buried with Napoleon but the offer went to the Patton family. And so while Beatrice is debating this, Jeffrey Keyes, who Patton visited in Italy, said, you know what? He really should be buried with his men. And Beatrice said, that's it. You're right, exactly. And so they, they end up burying him in Ham Luxembourg. Um, you know, this is, that's uh, George Meeks, his assistant, who was one of the pole bearers. He cried through the whole ceremony. Um, but uh, you know, uh, planes would fly and tip their wing during the, the funeral. Uh, the trains would slow down for about 20 years after that, every time they passed by the cemetery. But Patton was buried in a common grave. But over the years, um, so many people trekked through just to see his grave, they had to move it to the front of the cemetery. Um, I had mentioned Jean Gordon, the girl Patton had an affair with. After his death, Beatrice went to her brother-in-law and said, you know, I'd really like to have a meeting with Jean Gordon. Could you have us meet in the same room? But I want it to be a surprise. Don't tell her that I'm asking for this. And sure. So uh, Jean Gordon shows up in the office, and there's Beatrice, and she kind of stands there. And, you know, Jean Gordon is shocked, and Beatrice lays out an Hawaiian curse on her. And it's one of these, you made your flesh rot off your skin, da -da 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 -da, and just freaks her out, and she screams and runs out of the room. Uh, two weeks later, Jean Gordon commits suicide, puts her head in, a, in an oven, and turns the gas on. And uh, Carlo Deste wrote about this, and he said the, the, the rumor, but he hadn't been able to verify it, is that she did leave a note saying, I'm going to be with George before you. Um, so 1953, Beatrice passes away. Actually, she's on horseback and falls off, but she had had a blood clot to the brain, much like her husband. And um, the, the children want to bury her with him in the Halm Luxembourg Cemetery. Well, the military says, of course, no. Only the soldiers are allowed to be buried. There are no spouses, no one else. So they cremate her, bury her in the backyard near a big tree, and then about four years later, they dig it up, and they put some of the ashes in an envelope, and they go to the cemetery just as it's closing, and they sprinkle her ashes over George's and rub it into the ground. So they, they were together at last. Um, one thing about my buddy George, he was not sort of a pillar of social awareness. Uh, he definitely uh, didn't like anybody who wasn't white. Um, he, the real reason Eisenhower canned him from Third Army was not really much for the comparing the Nazis to Democrats and Republicans, was he left a lot of the Jews still in their camps after liberation and put SS guards on the camps. Um, at first, this was a good idea because they said, you know, these people have been starving to death for years. We need to regulate their food intake and all this kind of stuff. You know, and it's very famous that Patton threw up when he first went into, a, you know, when it, into one of these concentration camps and was just disgusted with Nazi philosophy. You know, he wrote about it extensively. 
And so as they're trying to, you know, reestablish these, what are called at this point, displaced persons, uh, they bring in a whole bunch of sort of mobile porta potties, you know, and they say, okay, you guys need to assemble these, and so you have sanitary, you know, facilities. Well, of course, these people haven't had any treat, you know, decent treatment in, in years, and so the, the, the equipment just stands there, and Patton, in his impatience, says, okay, these people are beyond help. We can't help them. We need to just close these things up and set them on fire. That's the kind of line that brings Eisenhower down to Patton's command for a personal inspection and sees that there are SS guards in front of these, you know, old prisons and stuff. And Patton says a few inappropriate things to Eisenhower, and Eisenhower's like, George, shut up. And Eisenhower realizes, I can't do this anymore. You know, I've got to relieve Patton. Uh, his public statements are a disgrace also. Uh, Eisenhower tells his son, I did not fire Patton for what he said. He said, I fired him for what he's going to say next. You know, he really was going off of the jaw. But I digress. Um, this is a rabbi. These are three rabbis uh, that wanted to be present at Patton's funeral. And they said, we know that about the things he said. However, what he did in World War II saved thousands of lives. He made the war go by faster, liberated our camps, saved so many of us that despite his prejudices, we are still going to pay tribute to him. So that's why they are there at the... Uh, at the cemetery. Um, and then finally, you know, there's Willie waiting to go home uh, with Patton's bags back to the United States. One of the questions I get a lot is when did Willie die? I've asked all the Patton family members, none of them know, but they always love to tell this anecdote about Willie that Patton uh, had captured at one point a bust of Adolf Hitler and they trained Willie that they put, put it in the background and Willie would pee on it. And so I thought that was a cool trick to teach a dog. Um, now, this next little series of photographs uh, are sort of a then and now uh, that from Patton's photographs. So this is the Temple of Hymera in Sicily, and Patton had a penchant for having his officers, his staff officers, stand in photographs, not because he liked them or anything, because he wanted to give perspective so you have an idea. And so you've got like uh, three pillars there, one that's really destroyed, the fourth, and then the next. And so that's what it looks like today. Uh, this had been a colony, uh, a Greek colony in Sicily, and uh, it's actually very well kept. Uh, if you drive along the north coast of Sicily, they, it's very well advertised how to find it. Um, this is Claremont. This is, uh, remember I mentioned between offensives, Patton put all of his tanks on a train and moved them up in World War I. This is where they, the tanks were moved off the trains so they could take part in the Musargan offensive. And so Patton in World War II revisits this site with one of his officers who had been with him in World War I. And if you look closely, there's a clock here on the wall and a train schedule right there. Um, so I found that about two years ago. It's a defunct train station now, uh, and it's a, just a little obscure town. But you can see they've moved the clock, but you can see where the old one was, and you can see where the schedule you know, was. This is the church Patton went to for uh, Christmas Eve Mass in Luxembourg. Uh, and it was after the Mass that he was told by a chaplain that the, he went and sat in the front row right side pew uh, and the chaplain uh, wrote him a letter afterwards and said that, by the way, where you sat is the exact same spot that Kaiser Wilhelm sat in World War I in 1918. Um, this is actually in an alley in Luxembourg City. So when I snapped this picture, basically my back was up against the wall of the alley taking it. That was very hard to find, actually. Um, and then finally, uh, this is a castle in uh, France near Laval. This is during the breakout when everything's going basically Patton's way. And uh, he said that this castle had only been captured twice um, since Third Army, before Third Army took it. And uh, it dated back, I think, to uh, Cardinal Richelieu fighting the Huguenots. And, you know, I lead tours over there and everything, and so I try to take people to Patton spots. And, you know, I think it's great because you yourself can find yourself in the footsteps of Patton. So um, with that, we're going to open up to questions. Uh, I, I was told to remind anybody who wants to step up to the microphone to ask, and I'll do my darndest to try to answer you unless no one has any questions. <laughs> yes, sir. Testing. Hello. There you go. <laughs> In the movie, the uh, first part of the movie is a speech. Yes. Is that an accurate representation, and when and where did it occur? Uh, a, it was an accurate uh, depiction. They did edit out a lot of lines. Um, there was a lot of profanity in it, but 
He would also, along with that sort of inspirational stuff from the speech, he would talk about the importance of a truck driver. You know, he says, you know, you know, think about the frontline soldier. Well, it's the truck driver bringing the supplies. It's just as important as the frontline soldier. So there was a lot of practical information in these speeches also, the importance of staying dry, things like that. Um, and he basically gave it all around England uh, prior to the invasion of Normandy. So it wasn't in really in one exact place. And it, it got mixed results. Um, a lot of women, uh, a lot of army nurses and wax did not like it. They thought it was too aggressive. Um, other soldiers ate it up. Um, but yeah, it's very accurate. In fact, I think Charles Province has a copy of the whole thing because some lieutenant typed it up while Patton was giving it and he transcribed it in a book called The Unknown Patton. And um, side note that uh, when Francis Ford Coppola wrote the script for the movie, uh, he finished writing it and said, you know, this guy is so unique and so interesting, I can't do a conventional biography. He goes, I got it. I'll put him in front of an American flag and he'll give this great speech. And so he hands the script in to 20th Century Fox and they say, this is the stupidest idea we've ever seen and they fired him. And they brought on another writer and they said the script was so bad that they went back to Coppola's original and Coppola was actually working fixing film machines when he saw them putting the uniforms and costumes together. He said, what are you doing? And they said, oh, we're m making this movie Patton. And he was like, wow, I wrote that. And later, Coppola goes to make The Godfather, and it's over budget, behind schedule. They're getting ready to fire him when he gets the Academy Award for writing Patton. And so they well, we can't fire the guy now, so he stays on and makes the movie. But Coppola says when he goes around the country and gives talks, he tells film students, the stuff you get fired from in your 20s is the stuff you get Lifetime Achievement Awards for when you're older. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, ma'am. Um, was Patton as devout as the movie, you know, perspe the perspective in the movie sure. was? And did he say that he read the Bible every... <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> It, that, that one of the great things about that movie is uh, the quotes are accurate. They just place them in different places just because it works better. And when he rolls into Palermo and they say, he gets the notice not to take it. He says, what do you want me to do, give it back? That was actually a, a city in Germany. Um, so the, the, in the movie they use his exact lines, but just not in the right places. I, I did see where he said that. That was a Stars and Stripes story uh, where he made that line about every, guy, every day. You know what I'm talking about. Um, but yes, very devoted. He was um, uh, raised a Protestant, but when he was born, they thought he was going to die, and they had an Irish Catholic nurse, and she baptized him a Catholic because she thought he was about to die on the delivery table. And so when he got stronger, they then went and had a, a Protestant baptism. But uh, it said that um, because of his Catholic roots that were accidental almost, that he made sure all the chaplains in Third Army were Catholic because he liked their sort of martial spirit, things like that. Um, kept the Bible by himself, you know, could quote the Bible like that, knew the Bible very well, and uh, definitely feared God. You know, when things went bad, God, why are you doing this to me? When things went well, he thanked God for them. Um, I'm sure his church attendance went down. Well, you know, the famous prayer in the movie, that was actually long before, the, about a month before the Battle of the Bulge, and he called the chaplain and he said, we need all these guys praying. You know, we, 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 they're not doing enough. And that's kind of the origin of the prayer. It really was Patton's idea. And then he asked the chaplain, how many of these guys are going to Sunday services? And he said, well, not enough, sir. And that was an element of the Patton prayer was to get soldiers to go to church more to pray for the success of Third Army. So yeah, it was, it was very real about him and, and, and the Lord. Yes, sir. Uh, during the movie, there, there was a big point made about his belief in reincarnation. Mm -hmm. One, is that true? And two, could you elaborate on that anymore? Yes, very true. Um, in the movie in North Africa, he drops to one knee and recites some poetry. Uh, it's, the, the poem is called Through a Glass and Darkly. And he kind of looks up at Bradley and says, you know who wrote that? And Bradley says, no, he says, I did. Well, that poem is actually about 12 stanzas long, and in it, each different stanza is about him in a different life, in a different army, uh, in previous lives. Um, when he goes to fight World War I and he's, he first arrives in France, uh, and they, they tell him that where his tank training area is going to be, he starts going down this road and he sees some officers that know the area and he says, listen, um, down there and to the left, left are some barracks, right? 
And they said, no. Well, actually, yes, there's some old Roman barracks there. They go, okay, okay. And he goes, and if I keep going up the road to the right, it is a mess hall, right? And they're like, no, well, actually, there's an old Roman mess hall up there. I mean, it was kind of eerie. I, I know some historians theorize that he read so much history that as he got older, he put himself in it. But, you know, here he is in World War I, and then there's a, a well-known story with Charles Codman. Uh, towards the end of the war, they pull into a town called Regensburg, and they're crossing the, the river. I think it was the Danube. And Patton says, man, you know, I remember crossing this river, and there was this big rock to the right of us, and Napoleon was standing there going, let's go, come on, we got to get into Russia. And Codman starts cracking up. Well, man, old man's nuts, you know, what's he talking about? And about two days later, Codman goes for a drive along the river and comes across this giant boulder. And he said, how did the old man know that? You know, we had never been here before. So I hope that elaborated nicely. <laughs> Anybody else? I got a whole bunch of stories, man. <laughs> couple quick sorry, a couple quick questions sure. about the photography itself. Yeah. Um, how often was he taking photos? Was he doing this all day long? Was it sporadic? How um, can I ask him real quick and then I'll just sit down? Yeah. How contemporaneously were they developed? Mm -hmm. And how did the military feel from an intelligence standpoint or anything about him taking all these photographs? Okay. Uh, okay. Got him. Um, how often did he take the photographs? It varied. Uh, ironically, I would say he probably took the most in Sicily while he was, and then while he was in exile, because he had nothing else to do but take pictures, uh, and then during the sweep across France. The least amount of photographs are uh, when he first takes command in Tunisia to fight, Ro uh, well, Rommel had left, but to fight the Germans, and the Battle of the Bulge, where he's so busy. In fact, he supplements his photographs with gun camera photographs from the Air Force and with maps. And um, in, uh, when he first takes command of Second Corps, it's a lot of behind the line stuff. And um, the irony is that in the movie Patton, the only time you see the camera is when he first takes command of Second Corps and he's taking off all the equipment explaining to Omar Bradley why they got their butts kicked and the camera's around his neck. And then the next scene was uh, in uh, the Battle of the Bulge when he's standing there in the snow and says, damn, I'm proud of these men. He's got the camera. So the, the times he took the least photographs is where you actually see the camera around his neck. Um, how about the developing of the pictures? Varied. Uh, he would either send reels home to Beatrice or he would have army you know, photo uh, officers develop them in theater. And the quality would vary. I, there's a lot of them that are very poor quality. And what I did was I hired a photographer to take to, to snap the photographs out of the photo albums themselves. And when we would come to these very deteriorated photographs, he explained to me, he said, Kevin, uh, you know, the silver emulsion that they used to develop a photograph uh, was of a poor quality when he was in this part of the world because that's why this photograph looks that way. You know, some of them are very clear and other ones, the, the, the images are so degraded you can barely figure out what he's taking photos of. Um, but like I said, it was varied because he would sometimes send the reels home, sometimes develop them in theater. I know that he had engineers develop some sort of quick rewind device for one of his cameras. Uh, and the last one was how did the, uh, the high command think about, what, what do they think, here's a soldier taking pictures on the battlefield. I've never seen anything positive or negative about it. I don't think that um, intelligent thinking had caught up with the technology in World War II. Uh, a number of army historians assigned to Third Army and other armies in Europe told me that they were all given the same camera that Patton had. It's called a Leica camera. It's actually German made, ironically enough, but they you know, produced them in Switzerland and other places. Um, so soldiers were issued cameras, you know, historians and reporters were issued cameras on the front lines. What would happen is, in the development process, somebody would look at it, and if someone's patch is showing, they put a white mark over it, or if uh, there was a street sign, they might white it out. So they would go through a censoring process, uh, and patents sometimes did and sometimes didn't. Did I get them? All right. <laughs> you okay? We're good? Anybody, if anybody brought a book, I'm gonna sit over here for a little bit and do some signing. Uh, anything else we need to? And my friend Carl is going to say a few more things. Kevin, we want to thank you for a great program. <laughs> 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 <laughs>